Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hi, Matt here, and I have a quick announcement before we get to today's episode. There's a new Facebook group for the Mineral Rights Podcast community, and I wanted to let you know about it. Just search for the Mineral Rights Podcast on Facebook. Be sure to hit like on that page. And on the menu for the Mineral Rights Podcast page, you will see a link for groups. And there you'll find the ground rules and goals for the community in the About section. Again, be sure to like the Mineral Rights Podcast page first, and then you can go to the uh, group. And I also will be doing some live Q&A sessions coming up in the future, so you can stay posted when those events are scheduled. Just visit the page, and you can see it under events. And in the meantime, if there is a question you would like me to answer live, you can send it to feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com. Again, be sure to join the Facebook group and like the Mineral Rights Podcast page in Facebook, and we will see you there. Now, let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your mineral rights and royalties. And Justin Williams joins me as always. Hey, Justin. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show, Justin. And uh, as always, Justin is here to provide the individual mineral owner perspective. And today we are going to provide an overview on how crude oil is priced as a follow-up to our natural gas and NGL price episode, which was episode 50. So if you haven't listened to that one yet, please do so as we go over similar details around how natural gas prices are determined and all the factors that go into it. And for this episode, we're going to provide an overview for crude oil and sort of all the different variables that go into how crude oil is priced and then also provide an update on recent activity in the market as it relates to the recent OPEC deal to help curb supply in response to the recent demand crisis that we're faced with as a result of the uh, coronavirus. So with everything going on in the world today, and, and we're recording this episode on April 14th of 2020, crude oil prices, as many of you know, have been really more volatile than ever. In fact, I was just looking at the crude oil price over the past six weeks or so, and the spot price for crude oil has seen some dramatic one-day changes since the March 6th meeting where OPEC couldn't come to an agreement on supply cuts and the start of the price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia that was uh, kind of in the midst of the falling demand due to the global coronavirus pandemic. And since that date, I I counted seven price swings of approximately 20% or more, which really is unprecedented when you look at historical oil prices. And one of the major factors contributing to these wild price swings is the fact that crude oil demand has just fallen off of a cliff combined with this unprecedented uncertainty around how long the coronavirus response will be required and how long it's going to then take for the global economy to recover once the all clear is given. And in this type of environment, as you can imagine, all it takes is a rumor around production cuts or supply cuts for oil price to spike in either direction. So um, Justin, let's take a step back and talk about the macro view before we get into the details of what's going on in the world today. Can you tell us a little bit about the macro level view around crude oil pricing. Absolutely. Let's dive in. So as with natural gas, at a high level, the price of crude oil is determined by the global supply and demand. When the global economy is good and and both developed and developing country economies are going strong, there's an increased demand for crude oil. Uh, This is because many countries rely on fossil fuels for transportation of people and goods, uh, for generating electricity, for heating, for cooking, uh, or in the summertime for cooling indoor spaces. In this scenario, the increasing demand puts upward pressure on crude oil prices, 
uh, when current and near-term demand exceeds supply. Similarly, during down markets, when countries are cutting back on spending, people are traveling less, fewer goods are being produced and shipped around the world, uh, then this puts downward pressures on the prices. In other words, crude prices uh, will drop. And this is because the, there is more supply than is needed to meet the needs of society. That is, supply exceeds demand. As extreme example of this uh, can be seen today with dramatic drop in global crude oil demand on the order of 20 to 30 percent, as Matt mentioned, due to the coronavirus pandemic, while supply remained at pre-pandemic levels. Uh, this delay is in curtailing the supply of crude oil was due to the price war between Saudis and Russians and the refusal to cut production and due to the lag time between other countries and oil and gas producers shutting in production in response to falling oil prices. One of the biggest influencers on crude oil price is OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, which has the largest combined proved oil reserves of around 72% of the global total and makes up around 41% of global oil production as of 2018. Historically, OPEC had been the, the valve where spare production capacity had been turned on or off to respond to global demand. In a free market economy, it is usually not efficient for oil companies to develop spare capacity and leave it idle because their goal is to maximize the return on investment for shareholders and to pay back that initial capital investment as quickly as possible. Like with natural gas, crude oil is traded over several different time horizons from the spot market at current prices or in the futures market at some date in the future. Like with natural gas, a crude oil futures contract is a contract to buy or sell a specific commodity at a certain price on a specific date in the future. When you hear about companies hedging production, this is what they are doing. Many companies buy futures contracts to sell crude oil in the future at a specified price as a form of insurance for prices dropping below their break even. In 2019, many operators hedged a percentage of their production at between 50 to 55 a dollars a barrel for West Texas Intermediate, which in the current market is looking pretty good. Now, generally, these future contracts are priced at a certain trading hubs, which may or may not be where they are actually producing these barrels. The NYMEX crude oil futures contract is based on West Texas Intermediate crude, uh, which is bought and sold at the storage hub in Cushing, Oklahoma. The full crude oil futures contract specs, which we will link in the show notes. Uh, so, Matt, it, that's a mouthful there, maybe a lot for uh, mineral right owners to take in. Yeah, there's a lot of things that go into it, as Justin mentioned. And one of the big factors, we'll, we'll talk about two things here, is location and then also some of the qualities or, or specifications around uh, crude oil. So, like we talked about in the natural gas pricing episode, Location is a big factor in determining the price of crude oil as well. In the U.S., there is a storage hub in Cushing, Oklahoma, like Justin mentioned, and that is where um, WTI is traded. And there are also um, other regional locations in the U.S. where prices are determined based on local infrastructure capacity and crude oil specifications, which we'll talk about here in a second. So first, let's talk about local infrastructure capacity. And this is one factor that determines the crude oil price at the wellhead. So in other words, if you're looking at your check stub and the price that was paid for those barrels of oil in a given month uh, from a well that you have a royalty interest in, that's one of the factors that goes into that. And when we say infrastructure capacity, what that means is um, whether or not there's space in a pipeline, or if there's a bottleneck in the pipeline, it's got space to to pump oil into the pipeline, or if it's full. And if you're in a location with um, bottlenecks in that pipeline infrastructure, then there is more supply than there is takeaway capacity. And in that case, you know, the cheapest way that you can ship a barrel of crude oil is via pipeline. And if that pipeline is full and you have to bring a truck to the well pad and load that truck and transport it to a major trading hub, well, that's going to cost a lot more money to do so. And so that's going to have to be factored in to the overall price that you receive because you, maybe you get that same price uh, in Cushing, Oklahoma, but you ended up spending 5 or $10 a barrel just to get it there. Well, your, your net 
amount is five or ten dollars less than than the WTI price, and so that's often what's called a price differential. And what that refers to is how much lower or higher the price is as compared to WTI Cushing crude oil. So for as an example, in the Bakken crude oil in the Williston Basin in North Dakota, typically trades at a discount to WTI due to this and some other factors. And so you may have heard that there's not a lot of pipeline infrastructure to get that crude oil from North Dakota down to Cushing, what they end up having to do is put it in tanks on trains and ship it via rail to where they can actually sell it in the marketplace. And that is obviously a lot more expensive than than pumping it down a pipeline. And on April 9th, just as an example, the WTI spot price was $19.38 and Williston Basin Sweet Crude was $13.75, and then Williston Basin Sour Crude was $9.19. So there was uh, more than a $10 price differential between WTI and Williston Basin Sour Crude in this case. And so that's what we say when we talk about price differential. It's what that specific barrel of crude trades for as a discount to WTI. Now, the opposite can also occur where actually you receive more than WTI. Obviously, it's maybe not as common. Usually when price differential is mentioned, it's a it's a discount, but uh, that is also possible. And I mentioned two things. There's sweet crude and sour crude, and we'll talk more about what sweet and sour mean in a minute. And uh, the point here, though, is just that the actual price received at the wellhead can uh, actually vary significantly when compared to WTI, depending on where you are, since those local supply and demand factors also play into uh, the price. And so like I, like we mentioned with the natural gas prices, if there's a local oversupply and there's nowhere to put it, then basically you're going to receive less for that product, whether it's crude oil, whether it's natural gas. And obviously the the best way that you can transport um, whether it's oil or natural gas, is be a pipeline. If the pipeline infrastructure is full, then you have to truck it. Or in some cases, actually, there's just so much gas, like we talked about in um, in West Texas, at least prior to the this uh, recent slump in the industry, that they were flaring gas. They were just they were burning it because there was nowhere else to go, and there was it was allowed by by law. Obviously, it's not ideal, but sometimes that's what's done. The other factors that determine the price of crude oil are the specifications. And when I say specifications, what I mean is what are the characteristics of that of that crude oil? And unlike natural gas, which generally has to meet certain specifications in order to be called natural gas, crude oil specifications can vary greatly. And there's different factors like the API gravity you may hear about. And if there's a light sweet crude, that has a certain API gravity, which is basically a unit of measure that tells you what the density of that oil is as compared to water. So a light sweet crude, if you were to pour this in a glass of water, it would float on top. Um, Heavy oil, some of that, if it has an API gravity lower than 10, would actually sink if you poured it in a glass of water. Now, that would be extremely heavy crude, but an example of a more typical heavy crude oil um, is that's produced from tar sands in Canada, and that has a lower API gravity and higher viscosity than some of the light, sweet benchmark crude oils like West Texas Intermediate, which is um, kind of the benchmark from a price standpoint. And then another one that's often talked about is uh, Louisiana Light Sweet or LLS. And those two, as compared to the Canadian heavy oil, are much lighter uh, in gravity. And so that's what we talk about, uh, lightness or heaviness. That's referring to the, uh, the gravity of the crude. Now, the sweet part, we mentioned earlier, the sweet and sour with that Williston Basin example, And sweet refers to 
the sulfur content. So if it's got less than 0.5% sulfur content, that's what uh, NYMEX specifies as uh, sweet. So if it has less than 0.5% sulfur, it's sweet. More than 0.5% sulfur content is referred to as sour crude. And when you talk about sour crude oil, it has high levels of what's called hydrogen sulfide or H2S, which is the smell of rotten eggs, basically. And that can actually be quite deadly at high enough concentrations. So there's a lot more precautions that must be taken around crude oil that has hydrogen sulfide in it, whether that's the specification of equipment to prevent that H2S from causing any sort of corrosion or other issues, as well as just the overall safety precautions. And so it's going to be more expensive to process that crude oil. And and that's what we talk about, heavy oil or sour crude oil, usually trading at a discount to light sweet crude because more steps are required to process it and to refine it. So let's bring this all back full circle to the current market uh, for crude oil. And we're talking again in April of 2020, the current situation that U.S. oil and gas producers are faced with today. So Justin, can you talk a little bit about some of the issues that we're seeing with OPEC and then what U.S. shale producers are dealing with right now as well. Sure. Uh, like we mentioned in the past, OPEC effectively was the valve where spare capacity could be brought online or shut in to help stabilize prices due to the changes in demand. Over the past decade, and especially the past five years, U.S. shale producers have effectively come in to fill part of the global crude oil and supply gap as onshore unconventional wells can be drilled and completed in a matter of months and at a fraction of the cost of large offshore crude oil development, um, which can take years to bring online and also cost billions of dollars. Even for these fairly short time horizon unconventional wells, companies rely on stable crude oil prices to base investment decisions on uh, that they can pay back the initial investment in a certain time frame. The issue that many producers are faced with today is that wells that are currently in the plan were based on oil prices of around $50 a barrel that just aren't economic to drill with $20 barrel prices. Many operators may have hedged and have future contracts where they have committed to selling a certain percentage of their production at set prices, which may help with this. Normally, these hedges can make up for any dips in the price of crude oil. One of the issues that many operators are facing is that there's just nowhere to put the oil as storage is already nearly full. This results in a higher price differential to W2I, and even this has to be subtracted from the hedge prices since they have to be able to deliver the oil to the designated pipeline or storage facility, which in this case is more difficult since there is not capacity in the system to do so. So even companies that may have hedged a significant percentage of their production at 50 or $55 a barrel may only be receiving 35 or 40 for these barrels due to the higher price differentials. In this case, it may put any new production below the break-even price to where they need to delay the investment. Compounding things even further, buyers can be very picky as to the API gravity and other specifications of any crude that they are willing to take in the current market. This is due to the glut in light, sweet crude oil in the U.S. and the fact that many refiners are designed around a specific blend of crude oil. Uh, according to the American Petroleum Institute, numerous U.S. refineries have invested in complex refinery units to process slates consisting primarily of heavy, sour crudes, effectively into gasoline diesel jet fuel, and other high-value products. Adding light sweet crudes to the input slates for such refineries increased their crude oil input cost, but does not necessarily provide a significant enough improvement in valuable product for the yields to be profitable. So what does this mean for oil and gas producers? That's really the big question. And really, at the end of the day, what it means is they're likely going to stop drilling new wells, um, or at least stop completing them until the prices recover above that break-even price. And um, local oversupply situations may actually force some operators to have to shut in existing production as well. You know, maybe not all of it, but certainly the, uh, the minimum amount that they would need in order to meet leasehold obligations so they don't run the risk of, for example, shutting in wells and um, maybe a lease doesn't have a shut-in provision. And if they were to shut in production for a certain period of time, that lease could uh, expire. And so that's a a big risk. So they're having to look at 
leases and see where they can shut in production, where they have to keep producing. Um, maybe it means that they produce one well instead of all 10 or 12 or 20 or whatever the number of wells is on a well pad. And just to keep the minimum amount of production going in order to hold leases. And in some cases, it may actually be more effective for some companies to monetize their hedges. In other words, to sell them if they have just a, a massive local um, price differential that they're faced with that would even still make it uneconomic to produce those existing barrels, even if they are hedged at 50 or $55, like Justin mentioned. So that's something to keep in mind. So what this means right now is we're starting to see some operators shut in production and the other companies are likely in the planning stages right now as to what production they can shut in while still meeting those contractual obligations. Again, whether that's those lease requirements or you know what they need to uh, produce in order to service debt that they have and you know try to minimize losses there are very few barrels right now that are profitable at you know $20 WTI prices so you know companies are really in a very defensive position right now looking at how they can lose the least amount of money in this current price environment and this is why we we keep coming back and harping on the fact that a strong balance sheet is really paramount for these companies to be able to survive this and to weather the storm. So in other words, just in simple terms, having more cash and less debt is going to help them stay in business. And the companies that have too much debt that are you know, maybe not hedged enough, they're going to be faced with um, a difficult decision. And, and in many cases, they're going to have to file bankruptcy. And so the supply cuts that we saw um, recently agreed to by OPEC and the G20 countries, I think that's the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, I think what we're going to see is U.S. shale producers are actually going to end up cutting more production than was uh, originally discussed as a potential number that U.S. could pony up as part of any sort of um, extended OPEC agreement. Just to put in perspective what, what did happen, though, with the recent OPEC agreement over the past weekend, the number they came up with is 9.7 million barrels per day supply cut. This is the largest in history by by a large number. Um, normally, when OPEC is talking a cut or an ad from a supply standpoint, they're talking, you know, half a million barrels per day or maybe a million barrels a day. So it's almost 10 million a day is is huge in terms of uh, kind of what's been done in the past. And that said, that massive cut only accounts for around 10% of the global demand. And there's been reports of global demand being down um, more by more than 30% right now just because of the reduced economic activity. You know, people not commuting, not flying on airplanes, um, factories are shut down. And so... These drastic measures that we're taking globally are having a significant impact on global demand for crude oil. And so I think what we're going to end up seeing is, um, like I mentioned, some producers are already starting to shut in production. Some analysts are projecting a two to three million barrel per day production curtailment in the U.S. I think when you compare that to where we were producing around 12.74 million barrels per day in January of this year. A 3 million barrel per day drop would be around a 23.5% drop in uh, production from that January average, which is which is a pretty significant drop. Um, if you think again, like 30% globally, if U.S. producers cut production here in the U.S. by 30%, that would be around 3.8 million barrels per day. And that would bring us down to a production rate of around 8.9 million barrels per day being produced. Uh, and I think what's going to end up happening is ultimately that number is going to keep going down until prices come back up. And obviously, there's a lot of factors that go into how much can actually be cut. You know, if you just recently completed a well, for example, you have to uh, flow back that well and get the water out and the sand and all the stuff that could potentially damage the well if you were to shut it in at that very 
early stage of production. So some of those early wells, they'll, they'll clean them up. You know, they'll find a safe point if they can with the formation. Again, it depends on across the, the country in these different formations. Some of them are more forgiving than others as to whether or not you can actually shut in production and then come back later and and turn that well back on and have flush production. In other words, production coming back and restoring um, what was lost in the interim when you had that well shut in. In some cases, if you do shut in that well, it's going to come back at a lower rate and you'll never recover those uh, those barrels that were, were shut in. And so it really is going to depend on the technical requirements in, the, in, in different basins or plays as to what operators can do to protect that asset, but then also, you know, minimize their, their losses due to the, you know, selling prices below their break-even price, which is which is kind of where we're at right now. So again, like I said, I think at the end of the day, the low oil prices are going to continue to exist until there's a major supply rebalancing. And, you know, the good thing is we're starting to see some of the countries globally where coronavirus cases are, are down, that they're um, starting to open back up slowly. Um, China was obviously the first to do so. Um, they're starting to, to get back into a more normal um, level of economic activity, although it's still down, I think, from pre-coronavirus uh, times. But uh, what we're looking at is until the global economy starts to pick back up and toward demand starts to recover, there will be a lot of uncertainty, uh, a lot of volatility in the market until we see some positive um, indicators that demand is picking back up and that there's a more of a balance between supply and demand. You know, again, like we said, it remains to be seen how much the U.S. will actually commit to in terms of uh, global supply cuts. There's actually today there's a, a hearing going on with the Texas Railroad Commission um, for the first time in over almost 50 years, they're looking at production quotas within um, Texas. Texas is one of the few states that actually has the system in place that the state can um, dictate the proration schedule and how much producers um, can actually produce. And so they are going to hear from all the different operators and kind of figure out what, what it means Um what the impact would be on the state level, the operators, and then uh, make a decision as to whether or not they're going to commit to any sort of cuts in production. At the end of the day, I don't know that it's really going to matter that much whether or not they, the U.S., whether it's the federal government or if it's uh, Texas or other states formally asked producers to cut back on production because that's going to it's going to be a symbolic gesture anyway. They're going to do what they need to do to minimize losses and to do the what makes the most sense from a financial point of view. And if it makes more sense to shut in those wells so they're not losing money, then they're going to shut in production anyway, whether or not somebody um, is dictating that. And so that being said, I think if there is some sort of symbolic agreement that could be um, put together, operators are going to shut in production anyway. If the Railroad Commission or the federal government can come up with some symbolic amount that they'll contribute to these global supply cuts, I think it will help to stabilize crude oil prices. But it would be a big step in a direction of more control over the market, which in the past has been pretty much a sort of free market economy. You know, operators come and do what's best, you know, from an economic point of view, not with what the country um dictates they should produce based on some sort of federal mandate. So really uh, interesting times we're, we're in right now. Really going to be interesting to see how that Texas Railroad Commission hearing um, shakes out. And hopefully we'll start to see the continued uh, restoration of economic activity as the number of coronavirus cases uh, stabilizes and starts to, to drop and as people get back to work. So um, definitely light at the end of the tunnel, um, hopefully sooner than later, just a, a really challenging time in the industry right now. But um, hopefully this information, which really applies to any sort of um, market environment and, and the considerations that go into pricing crude oil can help you. Uh, when you take a look at your check stub and you try to figure out 
you know, what you should have been paid and what the price of West Texas Intermediate was. If you're in a particular basin, you can search for the name of that basin and the crude oil and um, look for prices and you'll be able to look at some of the published prices for that particular area and uh, compare that with what you're getting paid. Some of these things uh, will help you understand what's going on. Absolutely. And it's a lot of information, but very, very useful information and uh, interesting times that we're in right now, Matt. Interesting times. You know, hope everyone is well that's listening to this. Again, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you. We're looking at trying to streamline our content for the remainder of the year. And so so if you're not on the email list, definitely go to mineralrightspodcast.com. You can slide up for our newsletter. So we have some free guides out there. Check it out. We have, again, some great guests coming up here. So subscribe and uh, we will talk to you next time. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.